As I mentioned last Sunday, today I'm beginning a sermon series titled Fruit Bearing that's based on just two verses from the New Testament, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, in which Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. And I'd like you to join me in reading together these two verses. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We'll take these one by one, and hopefully, when we're done with these series, you'll know them by heart, all right? Bishop, uh, British bishop and scholar N.T. Wright says, This passage provides a lovely picture of what true Christian life looks like. You know, when somebody calls himself a Christian, in my mind, what I am going through is this list and and asking myself, do I see the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience in that person's life? Also, in my reading this week about the fruit of the Spirit, I found this helpful observation in the New Interpreter's Bible. Uh, We should not interpret this fruit as referring only to character qualities of the individual, Paul is primarily concerned with the way in which the Spirit's work is made manifest in the community. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit isn't just something we seek for ourselves. It's not just about us. It's something that God's going to do for me. Uh, We really should be seeking this fruit for the community of faith, for the church, because God wants to produce this fruit within His people collectively. And these fruits are about relationships, really. So with that in mind, we begin by looking at the first of these fruits listed by Paul, which is love. And with that, I want to share a verse from 1 Corinthians 16. Let all that you do be done in love. Also, want to remind you, there is a sermon handout. Some people really appreciate these things. It either helps them stay awake by following along or helps them retain the information or gives them something to doodle on while I'm talking. So... Those are available to you as well. Would you join me in a moment of prayer, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jim Cimbala is the longtime pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, a large and dynamic 16,000-member multiracial church in New York. A quote from one of his books, Fresh Faith, has always held great meaning for me, and I don't think I've ever shared this with you before, but as we begin this series of sermons on a fruit-bearing faith, I think it seems an appropriate place to begin. Uh, Please listen closely. Cymbala writes this, When I was growing up, I thought the greatest Christian must be the person who walks around with shoulders thrown back because of tremendous inner strength and power, quoting scripture and letting everyone know he has arrived. I have since learned that the most mature believer is the one who is bent over, leaning most heavily on the Lord and admitting his total inability to do anything without Christ. The greatest Christian is not the one who has achieved the most, but rather the one who has received the most. Let me reread that last part again. The greatest Christian is not the one who has achieved the most, but has received the most. God's grace, love, and mercy flow through him abundantly because he walks in total dependence. As we talk about the fruit that God's Spirit can produce within our lives, it's important to understand that this isn't something we do on our own. It's, it's not something we create through our own effort. You see, in order for God to produce the fruit we'll be speaking of, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, it first requires an attitude of openness and even surrender on our part. We must allow God's Spirit to enter our hearts and our lives. And as Symbola says, it's about God's grace and mercy flowing through us as we live and walk in dependence upon God. Along that same line, no fruit grows apart from a vine or a branch. Apples don't suddenly appear out of nowhere. Bananas don't bounce into your cereal bowl out of the blue. Watermelons don't fall out of the sky onto your picnic table, right? 
No, a fruit cannot grow apart from its connection to a life-giving source, a vine, a branch, a tree. And we'll learn that God's Spirit is that source of power and energy and life to which we must be connected if there is to be any kind of spiritual fruit produced within our own lives. Let's also remember what we talked about last Sunday on Pentecost. When we speak of the Holy Spirit, we're simply speaking of God. The Holy Spirit is God. God present with us, inside of us, around us. Among us. So today let's consider the first of the, these fruits Paul says God's Spirit wants to produce within us, which is love. We may think we know and understand what love is, but the Scriptures, and especially the New Testament, provide a fairly specific understanding of the meaning of love. The word used most frequently in the New Testament and used in these verses from Galatians is agape. You know, I used to joke that in southern Illinois we say it agape, but it's really agape. Agape is self-giving love. It's even sacrificial love. Agape is unconditional love in its noblest form, love which gives without seeking anything in return. In the scriptures, agape also includes the idea of steadfastness and loyalty and faithfulness toward the object of one's love, which is, of course, how God loves us and how God's love has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. One more definition of love that stayed with me throughout my adult life. A seminary professor of mine, Dr. Ruth Tiffany Barnhouse, a brilliant, often wacky, and colorful woman. Uh, She was an Episcopal priest, a psychiatrist, and a seminary professor. Something else. She defined love by saying this, love is the connecting principle of the universe. Love is what brings all things together, and I think it is the best antidote to all the hatred and division and enmity we see around us in the world. I mentioned at the first service, you know, the word religion, uh, many believe, comes from religio, and ligio is like a, a, a ligament, it connects something. So religion is is reconnecting things back to the way they ought to be. And love is how God does that. It's through love God brings all things together. So love is the connecting principle of the universe. Now, not only does Paul list this first among the fruit of the Spirit, he also refers to love several times in his short letter to the Galatians, three times in chapter 5 alone. In Galatians 5, 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Now, the latter part of this verse was of great importance to John Wesley, who understood that faith chiefly is expressed through love. Faith is made effective, if you will, through love. Galatians 5.13, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Love, Paul is saying, frees us. It sets us free for a purpose, and that is to serve others. And then I love the next verse, Galatians 5.14, For the whole law, all of the religious rules and regulations, the whole law, is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it boils down to, Paul says. Love. Now stop and let me ask, when have you seen this fruit in someone's life? Have you known someone whose life was just filled with God's love? A person whose faith was expressed through love? A person who used his or her own freedom to love and serve others? A person who lived by the law of love and loved unconditionally and sacrificially and without expecting anything in return? I don't know how well this fits, but I've always remembered a story told by the late Dr. E.V. Hill. For many years, Dr. Hill served as the pastor of the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in the Watts area of Los Angeles, and he was a well-known and very well-beloved pastor and preacher. 
I had the privilege of hearing him speak in Dallas way back in 1980 when I was but a teenager. Still remember his sermon. During the terrible riots that broke out in Watts in 1965, Dr. Hill, himself an African-American, denounced from his own pulpit his neighbors who were burning buildings and destroying property and looting from area merchants. As a result of his outspokenness, he became a target for all kinds of terrible threats against his life. Late one evening, the telephone rang at Dr. Hill's home, and from the look on his face and the way he held the receiver, his wife could tell that something was very wrong. When he hung up, his wife wanted to know who called and what they wanted. And Dr. Hill didn't want to tell her, but she persisted. And finally, he said, I don't know who it was but they threatened to blow up my car with me in it. Needless to say, it was a long and restless night for Pastor Hill, worrying about the threat made upon his life, worrying about the safety of his home and his family. He had a lot of trouble going to sleep. But finally, around 2 o'clock in the morning, his weariness caught up with him and he began to doze. Around 7 o'clock, he woke up and reached over to touch his wife, and she was gone. And he was terrified. He began to search frantically all through the house and and she wasn't to be found. He looked out the windows to see if maybe she'd gone outside and she was nowhere to be seen. And then he looked out in the carport and he noticed that their car was gone. And remembering the threat from the previous night, he went toward the phone to call the police when all of a sudden out of a window he saw his wife turning into their driveway in their car and pulling into the carport. As she got out of the car, Dr. Hill shouted, where have you been? And do you know what his wife said? I just wanted to drive the car around the block to make sure it was safe for you this morning. From that day on, E.V. Hill said, I have never asked my wife if she loved me. Now that's love, isn't it? (laughs) And what an incredible portrayal, albeit a rather extreme one, of the kind of love we speak about in terms of agape. Love that is faithful and self-giving and always seeks the best for others. And I dare say it's the kind of love the Holy Spirit wants to produce within our lives. Are you wanting God's Spirit to produce this fruit in your life? Are you willing to allow God's Spirit to come into your life in such a way that the Spirit might teach you and help you to love, to really, truly love? Do we as a church want the Holy Spirit to produce and multiply the fruit of agape love within this community of faith? What would it be like if this church became known as a place where God's love is abundant in in abundance, it's present in abundance, that all who are hungry for a taste of God's love could find it here and among us. I really want these messages on the fruit of the Spirit to have some kind of practical application, and this morning I want to introduce you to a a breath prayer I have used off and on uh, for several years. This way of praying is an ancient Christian practice that goes back to at least the 6th century. It can be silent or it can be spoken aloud. And it usually incorporates a simple word or phrase that you repeat over and over again, often inhaling as you begin it and exhaling as you complete it. Some years ago, I was at a retreat down in Little Grassy and had some free time to sit down and and read from the Bible. And as I was reading in 1 Corinthians, this verse really came alive for me. And it said, let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. And since that time, I've often used this verse as a sort of breath prayer. Inhaling on the first phrase, let all that you do, and exhaling on the second, be done in love. Often doing it silently, let all that you do be done in love. One way you can use this breath prayer is by taking five minutes of silence each day and quietly repeating the phrase, let all that you do be done in love as you breathe in and as you breathe out. 
Some persons expend, extend that time to 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. But throughout the day, you can also stop for just a moment and offer this breath prayer wherever you're at, no matter what you're doing. Let all that you do be done in love. Or when you feel challenged and maybe you're tempted to act in an unloving way, maybe that would be a good time to quietly say this prayer. Now, the purpose of this breath prayer is simply to raise our awareness of God's Spirit in us and around us, to open our eyes to opportunities through which the Spirit might work through us to produce the fruit of love in some way, great or small. It's a way to make room for the Spirit in our lives to work. Now, in your bulletin this morning, you should have a a cutout dove like this. It's got the word love printed on it. And below it is 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says the greatest of these is love. What I'd like you to do is flip it over to the blank side and write these words on the back of it and do it now. Let all that you do be done in love. I want you to take that dove, put it in some place where you'll come across it each day. Your car, your purse, your wallet, your bathroom mirror, your desk at the office. And your assignment is to make this breath prayer a part of your devotional routine throughout these next weeks as we explore the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Let all that you do be done in love. And with that, let's remember that maybe, just maybe, the Christian life isn't so much about achieving as it is about receiving. Receiving God's life and power and grace within our lives so that we can bear fruit for God's kingdom. It really is about letting go and letting God work in us and through us. And let us also remember the words of Jesus who says, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we open our hearts and our lives to you. Work within us and among us that the fruit of love might grow and mature. Fill us with your agape love in such a way that we might truly do all things in love. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen.